We're finding more and more that non-human primates can live a surprisingly human existence. They compete, they have fights, they make and break friendships, and they get stressed out too. On this edition of Scientific American Frontiers, the effects of stress on humans and non-humans. We'll meet the man who spent 30 years figuring out how stressed out baboons get sick. We'll see why stress and anger can add up to a heart attack. I jumped through the doorways intending to crack the skull of anybody that was in there. We'll show how stress stops your body from healing itself. And we'll ask if it's possible to bring our bodies and our stress under control. I'm Alan Alda. Join me now as we try not to be worried sick. This program was made possible by contributions to your PBS station from viewers like you. Thank you. This is the Maasai Mara Game Reserve in Kenya. 700 square miles of rolling grassland filled with classic African scenes. When our cameras came here a few years ago, we were looking for these. Baboons are all over the Maasai Mara. They're smart and successful primates with no real enemies except perhaps themselves. In this respect, they're much like humans. Baboon troops have a lot of rules which would have remained known only to baboons if it hadn't been for a Stanford University biologist, Robert Sapolsky. In 30 years of study, he's learned not only the complex rules of baboon social life, but also how those rules can place many members of the troop under immense stress. He's now a leading expert in what stress does to animals and to humans. Okay, now don't be fooled. We've jumped from Africa to the San Francisco Zoo, and these are black buck, antelope from India. Recently, I caught up with Robert Sapolsky here to find out some of the basics of stress. So what, what, how does an animal like that experience stress? What, what, what happens? Well, it's your basic sort of crisis in the savanna there. You're running for your life. Something's coming after you. This is no time to plan for next winter's growth spurt. It's no time to... You don't reach puberty, it's no time to repair last week's injury. You mobilize energy to deliver whichever muscles are going to get you across the grasslands there. Increase your blood pressure so you get the oxygen going there in two seconds instead of three. So basically you shut down all the long-term projects and you just divert all your physiology to getting away from that tiger. When they're stressed because a, a predator is coming after them, how long does that tend to last? I mean, I mean, might not, might not be they be always uh, attacked by predators? Is it no. just really just a few seconds? I mean, that's the key difference between them and us. They are not thinking about predators. They are not thinking about any long-term. They're probably not thinking about much of anything. Um, but that may be sort of my primate bias. But they're certainly not having long-term psychological stress. Something happens, and it's over with in 30 seconds, or else they're over with. It's very short-term, acute stuff. They're not getting stressed you know, worrying about the ozone layer or the rainforest or whatever it is that sort of is psychologically stressful to us, they're not worrying about the long-term stuff. And every once in a while, one will pick up its head and it hears, thinks it hears something. And then they'll all get a little bit like that. And then maybe they'll take off. Now, in those moments, aren't they going through some beginning of this process, even if there's nothing really out there bothering them? Oh, yeah, absolutely. They're mobilizing. There's a whole physiology of not yet using all that energy, but getting ready to do it. And yeah, they're probably doing that 50 times a day for five seconds at a time. But the thing is that they're, when they're munching the grass, before they hear a sound or smell something that alerts them, they're not having this kind of anxiety thinking about it 
Uh, well, oh, even though I'm eating grass, somebody's liable to come along any minute now. Exactly. None of them are sitting there thinking, oh my God, I'm going to die someday. I mean, there's, there's not that anticipatory sort of angst stuff. Um, they're not sophisticated enough. They're not cognitively complex enough. All animals, including us, have this fight or flight stress response, as it's called, whereby we shut down everything except what we need to survive. The problem is that big-brained primates get stressed constantly by all kinds of things, like the stock market for us, or for baboons, like competing for social position. Antelopes, on the other hand, turn off their stress the moment the danger has passed and their physiology comes back into balance. You know that they're not in that physiological a state of stress yep. most of the time. And the best way to get a sense of that is the whole notion stress-related diseases, stuff you get by just turning on the stress response all the time, all the time, that's a primate invention. That's an invention of species that are smart enough to just get themselves sick with psychological nonsense. They're not up to that level. That's our specialty. Boy, are we lucky. <laughs> we got it. We got it. What a out. deal. What a deal we got there with that cortex of ours. Here's an example of baboon psychological nonsense, as Sapolsky calls it. The guy on the left is very worried. He knows he'll lose a fight, but it's a purely psychological clash, humiliating and stressful for the loser. Sapolsky sees baboons play out these kinds of mind games all the time. Sapolsky's been able to match up his knowledge of individual baboon psychological stress with what's happening in their bodies. In blood samples analyzed in the field, he measures the stress hormones that trigger the fight or flight response. They should be present only briefly, but in psychologically stressed baboons, they can be there over the long term with serious consequences. When a baboon is under stress, and it's, it's this kind of... Uh, long-term thing similar to what we go through what, what what's the baboon going through physiologically um bad news i mean you go back to the antelope running away from the tiger you mobilize energy to power your leg muscles get you across the savanna instead you're sitting there for hours each day thinking about that scary guy on the other side of the field or the mortgage payment due at the end of this month chronically you mobilize energy you don't store it your body wastes a lot of it. There's a bunch of metabolic diseases you're more likely to get. You're that antelope running for your life. You increase your blood pressure, deliver the oxygen, glucose in two seconds, blah, blah. Do that chronically, and what you're suffering from is high blood pressure. You're that antelope. Short term, you shut down digestion, growth, reproduction, immunity, tissue repair, all of that. No problem. Do all that stuff 30 minutes from now when it's all over with. Do it chronically, like a psychologically stressed primate. You get ulcers. You get colitis. You get reproductive problems. Your immune system doesn't work as well. You get more infectious diseases. And those same stress hormones, which short term can make you think more clearly, alertly, a very good thing for that 10 second sprint do it chronically and they can be in fact very damaging to the nervous system in the rest of this program we're going to look more closely at some of the ways stress can undermine health and we'll also see if there's anything we can do about it We're at the Wake Forest Medical School in North Carolina, in the lab of Jay Kaplan. Who do you think is dominant in that pen? No, I'd say... Kaplan has conducted a series of experiments that shed some light on the interactions among personality, stress, and heart disease. His subjects are macaque monkeys. In the wild, macaques like baboons live in large groups filled with competition and contention. Social hierarchies are established with dominant and subordinate animals. If I look in this pen now, I see the two monkeys on the right who look to be sitting exactly where they want to be sitting. One of them is now threatening three monkeys who are huddled off up on the upper left, hanging off the bars, which is a less preferred position. So I would say that these two guys are the dominant monkeys in this group, and the other three are more subordinate just by the nature of the way they're using the space in here. The relationships the monkeys establish are not an accident. 
They're determined by interactions of their personalities. Some are just naturally more aggressive, and they come to dominate. Primate personalities are stable over the long run, as Robert Sapolsky discovered with his baboons. Personality is the key to understanding their lives, he says. Does a difference in personality have something to do with how well they're able to handle stress or how much yeah. stress they experience? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, sort of my initial assumption that I sort of squandered my first 15 years on with them was dominance rank. That's the thing. If you're a low-ranking baboon, you're going to have the stress-related diseases. And what I've learned since then is, yeah, rank's important. Far more important is what sort of society you have that rank in. Is it a troop that treats its low-ranking animals miserably? Is it a troop whose hierarchy is unstable? Those are both much more stressful situations. And then even more important than your rank and the sort of society in which it occurs is your personality, which is basically saying, what's your filters with which you see the world around you and that's the single biggest predictor you look at a single question how often if you are a male baboon how often do you sit there in contact with another baboon grooming another baboon being groomed back get sort of an aggregate measure of that a, a sociality score and that's the single strongest predictor i have ever found of stress hormone levels in these animals in the macaque monkey experiments, the kind of social complexity which macaques and baboons show in the wild has been stripped away. Here, a group of five males, all strangers to one another, are placed together. They immediately set about establishing who's dominant and who's subordinate. This is exactly what macaques do in the wild. But here, everything's exaggerated. Groups are unnaturally small, and their members are switched often. So here, complex social relationships aren't as important as just the relative aggressiveness of the personalities. This is a stressful time. But the question is, who's under most stress? The top monkeys or the subordinates? Some groups are remotely monitored for vital signs, heart rate, for example. Hey guys. The dominance hierarchies within the groups are constantly reinforced with the leaders confirming their leadership. And as they do so, a surprising fact emerges. It's not subordinate, but dominant monkeys that are most stressed, with higher heart rates, blood pressure, and stress hormone levels. Maybe in the wild it wouldn't be so simple. But here, dominance equals aggression equals stress. Food is the next ingredient in the macaque experiments. The monkeys get a nutritious diet, but about one-third is fat. That's high fat for monkeys and about average for Americans. So the dominant males lead the same kinds of lives that many humans do. Plenty of stress with plenty of fat to eat. During the course of the experiments, the monkeys get regular checkups of their cardiovascular systems. This is an angiogram procedure to look at the coronary arteries, exactly like what a human patient might receive. Some of the experiments run for two years, and over that time, the dominant stressed monkeys develop twice the artery-clogging atherosclerosis as the subordinate animals. Animals who maintain their dominance under these conditions experience arousal of the fight-flight response, whereas animals who immediately become subordinate under these conditions don't experience those same cardiovascular changes. And it's the cardiovascular response that accompanies the behavior of maintaining dominance under these provocative conditions that we think is damaging when combined with a high-fat diet. Males whose aggressive personalities compel them to keep a cage full of subordinates in their place experience constant surges in heart rate and blood pressure, enough to damage their blood vessels and provide sites where artery-clogging deposits can build up. Good morning. Good morning. I'd like for you, please, to fill out some questionnaires for us. 
these are some standard psychological questions. So does aggressiveness damage arteries in people, too? Aggressiveness, along with mistrust and anger, define what psychologists call a hostile personality. These qualities are assessed with this standard questionnaire. No one cares much what happens to you. I have at times had to be rough with people who are rude or annoying. When people do me wrong, I feel I should pay them back if I can. 30 years ago, it was thought that type A personalities, dynamic, always in a hurry, got heart problems. But that wasn't always reliable. A few researchers thought hostility was a better match. So they went back through the records of old personality tests and tracked down the people who had taken them. Redford Williams takes up the story. What we found was that those people who had high hostility scores back in the 1950s were two to three times more likely to develop heart disease. And in one study, those with high hostility scores were about seven times more likely to die. Now, well, the first time it inflates, it might be a little tight. But in Redford Williams' lab, they've been studying how hostile and non-hostile personalities react to stress. John here, because we're going to be drawing bloods. Blood stress, hormone levels, blood pressure, and pulse rates will be tracked while subjects remember and relive a stressful event. First, unstressed resting levels are measured. Terry's blood pressure is normal, 136 over 72. The blood sample analyzed later will show low stress hormone levels. Okay, I'm just going to take the blood like we had talked about. Now I want you to recall a time, sometime in the past, when you felt very angry towards another person. This should be a situation or incident that still makes you angry right now when you think about it. I was an assistant teacher. Terry's blood pressure increases a little as her anger rises, about 10%. And we had a small girl. She had been abused by her mother, and, but she had gotten to the point where she couldn't even speak anymore. So they put her in our autistic classroom. Blood pressure is and up another 5%. She would come into class with bruises on her body. We called the social services. Although Terry's now clearly upset, her blood pressure and stress hormone reactions are mild. Get anybody to do anything about it. That made me angry. Now a different kind of stress and a new subject, right. Teresa. Your start number is 13,485. Teresa has to keep on subtracting in steps of nine as quickly as possible. Okay. Um, that would be 13,400 and you said 85. Um, 76. That's correct. The experimenter signals for Teresa to speed up. Now she's getting really flustered, but her blood pressure is hardly up at all. That's correct number, 13,476 minus 9. 76 minus 9, Teresa, is... Okay, now remember, accuracy counts. 64. No, it's not. I, uh... Got a phone call at work, and my co Now, here's Carlton doing the anger recall test. And it was the alarm company at my house, and my burglar alarm was going off, and police were called. Well, instant panic set in. I was scared to death. That's about the time my kids come home, my little, my little girl and my little boy get home from school. Already, and Carlton's blood pressure was, has shot up. I His panicked. pulse I is left. racing. I yelled at my boss, I'm leaving. I made the fastest ride home that I've ever made in my life. I got to the house and the police officers were leaving. So I grabbed a great big mag light flashlight that I have in my truck, opened the door, stormed into my house, yelling the whole time to the, I've got a gun, if you're in my house, come out. I jumped through the doorways, intending to crack the skull of anybody that was in there. I was so mad thinking about my kids. Unlike the others, Carlton scored high on the hostility questionnaire. Even low hostile people do get angry. I mean, everybody gets angry if provoked enough. And the fascinating thing is that when high hostile people get angry, they have this very large fight-flight response. But when low hostile people get angry, their response, their biological response, is much smaller. It's as though they are wired in a different way. The connection between anger and that 
arousal, that biological arousal for fight or flight is not so tight in low hostile people as it is in high hostile people. The lesson of the lab stress tests is that personality really matters. Just as with Sapolsky's baboons and Jay Kaplan's macaques, hostile, aggressive personalities experience more stress over the long term, and that's bad for their health. The one person that we had today who had a higher level of hostility on the hostility questionnaire showed a much higher level of blood pressure, both systolic and diastolic, during the test, during the anger, than the other three who had lower levels. And this is probably uh, what's happening uh, with us, and I include myself in this group, us high hostile people. Day in and day out, we're getting angry at little things. Our blood pressure is going up more than people like Tom here who don't have a high hostility level. And that's probably what's clipping off uh, our, our arteries and damaging our arteries and causing the increased atherosclerosis. Now, it's not the only thing, obviously. We have uh, our cholesterol levels, our health habits, our exercise habits, and Lord knows a multiplicity of genes that feed into this. But this is one thing that does feed in, and it, you know, it, you know, it doesn't mean you're for sure going to have a heart attack. It means that you've got a slightly but reliably increased risk. This is New York City, urban living at its most hectic and its most stressful. You may be surprised to learn that walking around hidden inside the chests of hundreds of New Yorkers are tiny stress measuring devices. Charles Harmon has one. He's an office worker and also a heart patient who carries an automatic implanted defibrillator. When clogged arteries reduce blood flow to the heart, heart muscle can be damaged. Damaged hearts can lose their steady rhythm. Extreme arrhythmia is called fibrillation, and the defibrillator shocks the heart back into action. Have you had any racing heartbeats? A little bit, I could feel it. Enough to set off the defibrillator? Not quite, no, I never did that. Did it make you feel dizzy or pass out? I didn't pass out, but I got a little dizzy. Okay. So let's interrogate the device. We'll talk to it. Implanted defibrillators are pretty smart. Not only do they constantly monitor heart rhythm and deliver shocks when appropriate, they also record everything they do. Nothing's happened since we last saw you a few weeks ago. Stress with its surging blood pressure and pulse rate can overload a damaged heart and disrupt its rhythm. Everybody is susceptible to stress and everyone can have a physiologic response to stress. It's the interaction of that response and a damaged, diseased heart that leads to dangerous arrhythmias. September 11th, 2001 was the beginning of a time of extreme stress for New Yorkers. All over the city, implanted defibrillators were sitting in the chests of heart patients, monitoring hearts, firing off when they detected dangerous arrhythmias, and recording their actions. Charles Harmon's cardiologist collected records downloaded from 200 implanted defibrillators. We found the results were quite striking. There was about a two and a half fold increase in the number of patients who experienced these arrhythmias in the period, 30 day period after the attack compared to the 30 day period before the attack. Stress can be the final trigger for a heart attack. It's estimated that 40,000 heart attacks a year are triggered by stress, as many as caused by strenuous exercise. And as we've seen, chronic stress clogs up arteries as well, damaging the heart and making it more vulnerable to an attack. So stress is a major risk to cardiovascular health. And next, we're going to see how stress undermines another of the body's essential systems. We're in Columbus, Ohio, at the Ohio State University's Clinical Research Center. The couple on the left, Eve and Bud, are going to let the researchers probe into the most private areas of their marriage. 
Now you should start like right here in the middle. Right. Like this. The researchers are trying to see if the psychological health of the marriage has any effect on the physical health of the couple. Okay, great. It's a gruesome but ingenious technique. Okay. The couple's given superficial skin wounds on the arm. Eight small blisters produced using a suction pump. Okay, now I'm gonna turn this on. Okay. Now, do you feel that? Yeah, I feel it. Okay, okay. It's an uncomfortable process, but not painful. You can't hear that? Yes, I can. Bud will get his blisters <laughs> next. You're just gonna do the best you can to fill out the bubbles. It's not a big deal. Okay. She cheats on all tests, you know that, don't you? Psychologist Tim Loving asks Eve and Bud to assess how much they disagree in typical sensitive areas, like money or in-laws. A zero score means no disagreement, so it seems Eve and Bud, who have been married 13 years, get along pretty well. After 10 minutes, nurse Lois Grinston checks her handiwork. Yes, lovely. The idea is to follow how well Eve and Bud's lovely blisters heal over the course of the next month and to see if the stress levels in their marriage have any effect. Ninety couples are in the study. The healing process will be monitored visually and by measuring the rate the blisters dry out. Also, during the first 24 hours, fluid placed in little chambers above the wounds will be drawn off. The fluid will be assayed for the chemicals which the body's immune system sends to wound sites to get healing started. Okay, guys, we're getting ready to get started now. And I'm going to close the curtain. With the blisters in place and Lois Grinston ready to draw blood samples, Eve and Bud are supposed to start arguing. Likely hot topics have been suggested by the researchers after exploring with the couples the questionnaires they had filled out. For Eve and Bud, they've zeroed in on Bud's hearing aid, or rather his lack of a hearing aid. When they put me in the casket, you can go ahead and put now the hearing we, aid in my ear. The bad thing is we even have a hearing aid at home that you could wear so that you won't have to keep saying, what, 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 even when we're watching a movie. As with the hostility study we saw earlier, blood samples will show what levels of stress hormones the argument stimulates. Well, yeah, keep rewinding the movie so you can hear what they said, which is aggravating. Well, you should put the hearing aid in your ear and listen to the listen movies for a while movies. and see what the hearing aid sounds like. You've never had it in. How do you know? You've never tried to watch a movie with it. I watch a movie with one sometimes. In fact, their hearts aren't really in this argument. When sometime. Next time we watch a movie. Okay, I'll go rent one tonight. Uh, I didn't say that quite that soon. <laughs> I don't Bud and Eve are really movie. pretty good friends. Their argument provoked no stress hormones in the blood. Their immune systems responded strongly to the blisters, and healing was close to complete by around day 12. They're a typical unstressed couple with healthy immune systems. Now let's follow Deb and Mike through the same procedure. They've been married 10 years. They don't regard their relationship as terrible, but neither one has any difficulty coming up with multiple areas of disagreement. The researchers have several topics to suggest for discussion. For Mike and Deb, how to divide time between chores and relaxation is a contentious area. Observing this session is Janice Keekholt Glazer, the psychology professor who developed these tests. Yeah. All right, well, I, we, oh, wait. we can... Number one. Well, we can start Number talking. one, two hours. You know what, oh. I put my workout schedule together for you on the fridge so you can see what oh. days I'm going to run. <laughs> Number one, you need a healthy heart, and number two... As before, blood samples are taken to measure stress hormone I levels. I talk about excessiveness. I talk about in our lives right now... That's how you accomplish things. We're, we are so busy from the minute we wake up till the minute we go to sleep. Let's take, for instance, the morning. When I wake up, you wake up, you get yourself ready, mm -hmm. and you go to work. Yep. I get myself up, I get myself ready... I do a load of laundry, check the emails, pack the kids' lunches, put the dishes away. Uh, if yeah. you guys get together once in a while, whether it be in the evening, How long is once in a while? I don't know. I mean, I don't Deb know. Deb and Mike may not have a perfect relationship, but as with almost all the couples in the study, it's still a marriage that works. In fact, Deb and Mike don't regard this argument as especially stressful. You got to do it the way I like it. 
the couples who tended to be nastier or more hostile toward each other had higher elevations in stress hormones, particularly the women. Um, and they had greater changes 24 hours later in terms of a whole battery of different immunological assays. We were surprised because the conflicts, the discussions of disagreement, weren't what you'd call heated or nasty by and large. It's only a relative kind of thing. These were very happy couples. They only represented, among the, the sample we had, only 3% would be what we would call distressed couples based on the way they described their marriages. And yet we could find these reliable relationships between physiology and behavior. Here are the blisters, unhealed at day six in one of those mildly stressed marriages. And here they are, nearly healed at the same day in an unstressed marriage. It's a dramatic contrast given the relatively low stress levels involved. Hey guys, how you doing? Good. Dr. Poole, it's nice to meet you. So what are we supposed to be doing today? Today is head and neck. Head and neck exam. These are medical students in the last few weeks before important exams. It's a kind of high stress situation we all find ourselves in from time to time. Uh, you could look through the Look through the scalp, see if there's a... This is another Ohio State study. This time to see if it's possible to deliberately counteract the effects of stress. John Stauffer and Ben Taylor are second-year students just coming up for their first clinical exams. A total of 57 students received the same blister wounds the married couples got, with the progress of healing to be tracked in the same way. We place it just on top like that. Soraya Rafaga is just completing her neurology rotation, and she has a big final exam in two weeks. Well, she's a 21-year-old white female with a 15-month history of weakness in her lower extremities, which began in July 2001. Um, when she noticed like, increased difficulty when she was walking to and from work, she has had increased weakness in the past. The students months. continue with their routines as the blisters on their arms heal. Cane, so functionally, she's really decreased, and they're thinking about putting her in a wheelchair. The students were randomly assigned to two groups. John Stauffer was in the group that was simply left to cope with the stress in their own ways. Ben Taylor's group got something extra. Breathe slowly and deeply. You let tension go and you let yourself go deeper. Begin by relaxing your right foot, just letting the tension flow out. Throughout the pre-exam period, all of Ben's group attended frequent sessions in which they received standard relaxation therapies. Down into your fingertips, every muscle fiber just letting go. All the students were tested again to compare healing during a relaxed exam-free period. That ensures it was really the stress of exams being assessed, not simply the stress of receiving the blister wounds. The study showed that students under a pretty common kind of stress suffered the same effects as the stressed married couples. Increased stress hormones in the blood, reduced immune system function, and delayed wound healing. But it also showed that the simple relaxation therapies that Ben's group received were remarkably effective. Their blister wounds healed up as rapidly as everyone's did during the relaxed non-exam period. The conclusion that our immune systems don't work so well when we're under psychological stress is completely consistent with what we know about the fight-or-flight stress response. After all, the whole point of the stress response is to briefly shut down non-essentials while we make a quick getaway. You can afford to put off fighting infections for 30 seconds. But that means long-lasting stress makes us more vulnerable to disease. Exactly which diseases or how severe they might become is still controversial. But the basic conclusion that chronic stress and disease go together is beyond doubt. Next, we're going to explore further what we can do about stress. That's picking up what? 
This is the photoplethysmograph, and this is picking up your skin conductance, which is another way of saying your skin sweating. You sweat uh, uh, enough uh, to, uh, to, to indicate a change in, um, I mean, a, a subtle change? Oh, in yes. Every time you experience any kind of emotional change, your circulation changes. I always seem to be the guinea pig on Frontiers. This time they want to see if I can relax. What I'm going to do now is just wipe off your forehead just okay. to get any extra oil off and put the muscle tension monitor on you. Okay. Sensor. Okay. Now, a muscle, well, how, how do you measure muscle tension on my forehead? I have, I, I'm not known for the muscles in my forehead. Well, there's not a lot of fatty tissue on the forehead, mm -hmm. and it's considered to be a good indicator of the muscle tension in the rest of your body. What happens? What are you, what are you measuring? Well, it actually measures the electrical impulses put out by the muscle. Oh, I see. I'm just going to put the lead up. <laughs> it's not going to be the most comfortable thing, but... Uh... How many years have you been doing this? This show we've done, um, I've been doing it about seven or eight years. All right. Now I'm supposed to get into a normal, even state of mind as I make small talk with Herbert Benson. For 35 years, he's been a leading advocate of relaxation as a useful medical therapy. He even coined the phrase relaxation response to describe what I'm about to do. But first, just to make a nice contrast, I get to be totally frantic while everyone watches my numbers go off the charts. If I give you the number 113, I'd like you to subtract 13 so that you have 100, and then you subtract 13 again to have 87. Nice. I'm going to be testing you for speed and accuracy, so it's very important that you're accurate, but also very quick. Right. Okay? <laughs> Do you have any questions? No, I but would... I, can, I know my needle is jumping. Okay, okay. I would like you to say the numbers aloud and as fast as you can. Uh -huh. Okay? So I'm going to have you start from the number 6,046. And subtract 13. That's right. 6,046 minus 13, 6,033. Right, faster, keep going. Oh, I keep going. Yes, oh, keep sorry. going, sorry. Uh, 6,033, 6,020, 6,003, no, 6,006, no, 6,007. Could you just start over from the beginning, 6,046. <laughs> <laughs> okay, start so over. 6,046. 6,046 uh, minus 13, 6,000. <laughs> I'm sorry. 6,046 minus 13. I could do this the first time. I can't do it now. 6,000. As I'm flailing around, it's not just these measures that are jumping. The stress hormones in my blood must be surging, too. 6,020. Mercifully, Herbert Benson comes to the rescue. 5,704. Let me show you how to evoke the relaxation response. So if you will, just close your eyes and relax all your muscles, starting with your feet, your calves, your thighs. Shrug your shoulders around. Flow your head and neck around. Great. Wonderful. Now sit without movement and just focus on your breathing. But breathe oh so slowly. Each time your breath is coming out, say silently to yourself the word calm. And you're going to find all sorts of other thoughts coming to mind. Those thoughts are natural. They should be expected. But when they occur, don't be upset, but simply say, oh well, and passively come back to the word calm. On each out breath, calm. And as the other thoughts come to mind, just oh well, and back to calm. This is a simple, basic form of meditation. The sensors confirmed what I was beginning to feel, that I was more relaxed. Now just slowly, slowly open your eyes. How was that? It's nice. You got into it nicely. What did the physiologic uh, changes show? I think the most dramatic one was um, your muscle tension measured right here. Before it was so high, it was off the screen. <laughs> and, and after about a minute and a half, it, it came down quite nicely. This is how you can use the mind to affect the stresses of the body. 
and to the extent that any disorder is caused or made worse by stress, to that extent we can use this as a therapy. Is there a difference between um, what you might call chronic stress and, and momentary stress? I mean, is, is it is it good for you to to have short bursts of stress that you can handle? The more the stress, the more efficient you are, the more um, uh, productive you are, but to a point. Mm -hmm. When it gets too chronic, and then performance and efficiency start dropping off, mm -hmm. and that's what most people are experiencing. John Goddard is one of the beneficiaries of Benson's relaxation therapy. Once a victim of panic attacks, depression, and high blood pressure, he's now mentally stable and off his blood pressure medication. He says his daily meditation is responsible. It's given me my life back. I was uh, hiding in my house for 12 years. I was so frightened. And now I'm out in the world. I'm actually working again. It's just so fantastic. Gina Francis failed for years to get pregnant. After learning relaxation techniques, she now has one child, and there's another on the way. Elisa Toledo had a stress-induced heart attack. Her cardiologist recommended yoga-based relaxation for stress management. When I used to feel stress, I would do very shallow breathing, and that really is a sign of stress. And by telling yourself uh, the same word all the time or focusing on the same sound, you can de-stress yourself uh, very quickly. I mean, it doesn't happen like within seconds, but you can, you can over a, a period of a few minutes uh, distress yourself. Where before, I didn't, know, I didn't know to do that. You know, I would be stressed and uh, I would just probably stay stressed for the day. It makes sense that reducing stress lowers blood pressure or increases the chance of pregnancy because the fight or flight stress response does the opposite, increases blood pressure and shuts down reproduction. But exactly how meditation and yoga function to reduce stress is still something of a mystery. This is northern India, the foothills of the Himalayas, and the year is 1981. These scenes were filmed on visits led by Herbert Benson to track down experts in Tumo Yoga. It's practiced by Tibetan monks who had followed the Dalai Lama here when he was exiled. Benson, knowing of the Dalai Lama's reputation for openness, got permission to investigate. For, for years, the practice of Tumo has been a secret within uh, Tibetan Buddhist practice, and he allowed uh, um, the West to have studies of this for the first time. Well, why is that? <laughs> Yes, um, as you mentioned, uh, this is a practice usually regarded as a secret doctrine and also um, a private thing. But I feel, you know, as usually is, I believe and also is explained to people that we are is believing or uh, emphasis on, on reasons and facts. If it's something true, something fact, then the, uh, the investigation taken through or meditation and investigation taken through instrument may reach is the same point. The Tumo meditation experts live alone in unheated stone huts at high altitude. Benson was able to bring some into town for tests. He was astonished to learn what they were capable of. What their monks can do in Tumo Yoga is essentially naked in midwinter with four, in 40 degree Fahrenheit temperatures, take a sheet measuring six by three feet, dip it in icy water, wrap themselves in that sheet. You and I will go into uncontrollable shivering and perhaps even die. They can get that sheet steaming within three to five minutes. We've been studying that for 20 years. Benson brought back now famous film of the Tumo monks drying their ice-cold sheets. 
For them, it's of course an essential religious ritual designed to create a fire which burns away all traces of improper thinking. For Benson, it was simply astonishing. And in fact, he found with his tests that monks could at will raise the temperature of their extremities, fingers and toes, by as much as 15 degrees. At the same time, they don't increase their heart rates, he found. So somehow they must be deliberately opening up their blood vessels, increasing the flow. I'm no Tibetan monk, but after my relaxation session, the idea of warming yourself up didn't sound out of the question to me. Three quarters of the way through, trying to uh, repeat the word calm, I felt warmer. Exactly. That's a common response. You see, the stress hormones lead to vasoconstriction. That's just what we were measuring, muscle tension. When you evoke the relaxation response that way, what then occurred, that hormone was counteracted, and that led to a warming of the skin. But how exactly are the stress hormones counteracted? Usually, the fight-or-flight stress response is beyond our conscious control. It just starts and stops automatically. Somehow, meditators tap into the part of the brain that controls the switches. And you don't have to be a Tibetan monk to do it. community just outside Boston which follows the Sikh religion and practices a kind of yoga called Kundalini, which literally means coiled like a snake. Kundalini yoga aims to uncoil the snake, unleashing the energy of body and mind. Aramander Kurkalsa has practiced Kundalini for about 10 years. She's come here to the Massachusetts General Hospital so researchers can look into her brain while she meditates. The study is being run by Sarah Lazar, a psychologist assisted by Katie Kilalea. So this should be just a little snug. It should definitely not restrict your breathing, but you should feel it move upon inhalation and exhalation. Just tight enough. Hiramand is going to be wearing uncomfortable wires and tubes, and she'll be inside a noisy MRI machine. So she needs to be an expert meditator to avoid distraction. Can you underneath your legs? Yeah. Okay. Um, this is it. it goes into place. Okay. There's a frame to hold a mirror so she can read an instruction screen. The operators line up the 30 thin slices in which the machine will picture brain activity. Okay, we're going to get started. This one's going to be a little bit loud. And it's going to last 32 minutes. Go. First, in this control period, Haramander's screen tells her to think randomly, to run through an arbitrary list of animals, for example to show what a brain that's not meditating looks like. Right now, her breathing's about as expected. At this point, uh, she's breathing at a fairly fast rate. This is about 12 breaths per minute. When she starts to meditate, Haramander's breathing should change. Now her instruction screen switches. Begin meditation. Begin meditation. A common type of kundalini meditation involves coordination of breathing with repetition of mantras. Breathing rate drops dramatically without the meditator forcing it to. So you can see, now it's getting much wider, so she's beginning to meditate. So before, she was going about 12 breaths per minute, and now she's going, these are much longer, slower breaths, longer, slower exhalations. As I inhaled, I thought Sat Nam, and as I exhaled, I thought, Wahe Guru. So it involved a focus and also with the breath. And I just uh, kept uh, focused on that and then allowed whatever changes uh, would come about 
to heaven. This is one particular slice through the brain, and here we see a bit of the limbic system called the amygdala, circled in blue. And this time course is the average activity of that bit of brain during the experiment. This bit of brain becomes more active during meditation than during the control period. So there's something going on during meditation which is not happening during just sitting there repeating the words of animals. Do you know other stuff about that part of the brain that, that throws light on, on um, right. what, you know, what functions are otherwise mm -hmm. performed by it? Mm -hmm. It's involved in vigilance, so paying attention to things. And so certainly um, events which provoke fear, i.e. lions and tigers and snakes, would activate the amygdala, but also other things. And so since when you're meditating, you're being vigilant on yourself, on your mantra, and on your body, and um, your subjective state, that's why we think we see the amygdala during meditation. What other kind of vigilance uh, are we um, talking about? If you're hungry and you're driving down the street and you want to pay attention to which restaurants are there, that might be something similar. So it's vigilance to things which are biologically relevant. I guess that's a better, being more, uh, uh, more precise. Um, but probably not vigilance of, say, um, you know, reading a book mm -hmm. or uh, watching a movie. It's not the same attention. It's more, it's got to be biologically relevant, they think. Isn't that's that interesting thought. that meditation, which is supposed to be so spiritual, oh, lights right. up the part of your brain yeah. <laughs> that a sirloin steak does? Exactly. <laughs> People once thought meditation was a bit like dozing off. So the detection of vigilance in Haramander's brain is especially interesting, and it matches what she feels. There's a complete awareness, and in a way, even a more heightened awareness of everything. And then, um, uh, with the particular sounds, uh, Satanam felt like it was very f uh, focusing for me. And then Waheguru had a very kind of expanding feeling and uh, of awareness. So I felt more uh, unified in my experience of um, the MRI <laughs> and of myself. I did think of a pretty straightforward way to explain the brain activity. But Sarah Lazar and her latest tests had gotten there first. Let me ask you a kind of a dumb question. Mm -hmm. uh, how do you know they were meditating? If, if, they, if they can just bring their breath down to four breaths, to a, four minute. breaths a minute mm -hmm. mechanically, mm -hmm. then maybe you get this kind of, um, um, maybe these, these are the parts of the brain mm -hmm. light up anytime you bring your breath down to four. <laughs> four right. times a minute. Very good question. That's another experiment we're doing this time, is uh, we're having them go down to four breaths per minute. We're showing them um, arrows and telling them when to breathe. And so far, what we've seen is that, no, this is not the pattern you see when you oh, just change really? your breathing rate. Right. Yeah. So there's something more to it. Um, uh, so, no. <laughs> <laughs> Sarah Lazar's experiments have shed some light on how meditation and relaxation reduce stress because the part of the brain that was active in the meditators is also involved in sending signals that control the fight or flight stress response. But we still don't know how meditators change those signals more or less at will. Regardless of how it works, Meditation does help people deal with the stress of life. This is how Haramander puts it. Life presents situations, and most of these situations, I'm not going to know what they're going to be. And so by encountering my own self, my own mind, through meditation and my meditation practice, then when I'm out in the world, whatever confronts me, I've already confronted my own self and my own reactions, so that I can confront it squarely. But let's say you're worried about your health, or you're worried because your boss is stressing you all the time. Can simply meditating relieve you of that stress, or do you have to go through a, 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 an involved uh, psychotherapy? It's very important to try and change the situation itself. In other words, if it's a social situation, recognize it for what it is and try and rectify it. But if you can't, as many of us can, change the situation, then you could protect against the harmful effects of stress or at least lessen them by regularly evoking the relaxation response. Mm -hmm. And people should do that regularly. Just think of the numbers of people who have told you, without my yoga, without my 
um, daily exercises. Many will say, without my prayer, I don't feel as calm as I do otherwise. And although this is in speaking to the uh, inherent value of the beliefs in these various things, it certainly shows their effects. So, can we be worried sick? No doubt. Are less stressed people less sick? Yes. Can we deliberately reduce stress? Yes. And don't forget what Robert Sapolsky found. His least stressed baboons were the guys who just got along with others the best. Come visit us at PBS Online. Scientific American Frontiers can be found on the World Wide Web at pbs.org or America Online, keyword PBS.